Welcome back students. Today we are going to discuss about the language and a brief history of anatomy. The notes for this session they are prepared by Dr. Rusa, Head of Department of Anatomy, School of Medicine at Muimbiri University of Health and Allied Science. The facilitator in this session, I am Helbert Mlela, the student at Muimbiri University of Health and Allied Science. So, uh, first, anatomy is divided into four modules. Uh, module 1 is gross anatomy. Uh, module 2 is histology. Uh, module 3 is clinical embryology. Um, and module 4 is dissection anatomy. Uh, gross anatomy actually is sometimes called as microscopic anatomy. We are just studying uh, the structure and arrangement of the structure of the whole body uh, from the head and neck to the legs or to the lower limb. Then in histology, that is the microscopic. We are studying the cellular composition of each part of the body, uh, the cells which make up eyes, which make up ears, which make up test buds and different organs of the body and even glands. Uh, in the clinical embryology, we are studying about the development uh, of the human eggs from where they are undergoing fertilization uh, to the stage that the mass undergo delivery. And in dissection anatomy, it's just like a practical studying of gross anatomy. So dissection anatomy, we are going to, discuss, uh, to dissect cadavers where we shall see uh, the arrangement of the structures which we studied in gross anatomy as theory. So the cause of module objectives, first a student should be able to use correctly uh, the terminologies in the medical or health professions. And the second module objective is to demonstrate the understanding of the body composition macroscopically and microscopically. So here we are discussing the module objectives about the uh, objectives of studying uh, the module or cause objectives of studying anatomy. So uh, the student should be able to explain or to understand the composition of the body macroscopically and microscopically. Uh, you should know about the composition of bones, muscles, nerves, joints and skin. How are they arranged in the body and what cells they are making them and how the cells which are making these organs can be affected by different chemicals or medications. Also, uh, the students should understand about the internal organs such as brain, such as brain managers, lungs, heart, liver, pancreas, stomach, intestine, and genital urinary organs. Also, you should know how to link the organ structure with the disease mechanisms and the approaches to management of disease conditions. So what is the major importance of anatomy in the medical field is that we are studying the arrangement of the body organs and their composition. After knowing the arrangement and compositions of the body organs, then we are linking uh, the composition and the arrangement of body organs uh, to the clinical conditions or to the different diseases mechanisms and how can we manage uh, the disease conditions as compared to our knowledge of anatomy that we studied about the structure and composition of the body. Uh, but the session objectives are uh, should be able to describe the composition of anatomy as foundation of medical profession. So these are just the objectives of this session which we are studying about the, about the history of anatomy and the common terms used or the language used in anatomy. Also, the student should be able to use introductory terminologies in the medical health professions. So let's go on. Firstly, uh, we should know about the definition of anatomy. Anatomy, by definition, is the study of the structure of the body in its normal health condition. So in some of the cases, we will discuss about the uh, clinical cases or diseases. But anatomy, actually, we are studying multi uh, the structure of the body in its normal health condition. So in anatomy, we should know first how the organ or the cell, they appear in their normal structure. After knowing uh, the appearance in the normal body, then it is easier uh, to say or it is easier to comment if the cell 
if we observe the cell well, by using microscope, it's easier to say if it's normal or it's abnormal. So knowing normal will really easier us to say uh, the abnormal cell or to to figure out how the abnormal cell they appear. So anatomy simply is the study of the body structure or structure of the body in its normal health condition. So we are studying them macroscopically by observing by our own eyes, then microscopically by observing using a microscope. So it's the foundation of the medical knowledge that knowing anatomy and physiology, you can't know anything because anatomy is the study of structure and then physiology is the study of how uh, the structures function each other or how uh, the structures depend to each other and how are they working together in order to make the living organism alive. That is the physiology. But anatomy, you are studying structure. So the word anatomy comes from two Greek words that are ana and tom. Uh, ana means body and tom means cutting. This is because in the studying of anatomy, they use the cadavers and they cut through the body to know the structure, how are they composed and where are they passing. So that's why anatomy, uh, if you connect these two terms, it means as body cutting. Why? It is because the study of anatomy involved the dissection of cadavers, cutting the body to know how are the structure arranged or how are the cells arranged. So we need to cut cells uh, to prepare uh, smears and this, then smears. Uh, we may do strain to them using hematoxin and eosin, as we shall study later in uh, in histology. Then we are studying the structures. So that is all about the definition of anatomy. So after there, let's see about the founders of anatomy. Uh, our first founder of anatomy is called Hippocrates. Hippocrates. Uh, he lived 460 years to 377 years. Uh, before Christ, and he lived in the present in the present days, what is called as Greece, uh, is called as Greece. So, Hippocrates actually is the father of medicine, and he was the first man to suggest about the idea of the arrangement of the body organs. And because he the father of medicine, uh, he he just he deal uh, he deal with he different. He, aspects of uh, medical study. So he is also the author of what you call as a Hippocratic Oath. Hippocratic Oath, the oath are uh, taken by the medical professions when they are, they are entering in the, in the employment. So actually he just suggested uh, some of the ideas of anatomy, but actually uh, they don't figure out what he suggested. Some of the founders of anatomy, as we shall see later, uh, they have figured out what they suggested. But in the case of Hippocrat, he just suggested the main idea of anatomy because he did uh, he he deal with anatomy or with human body with medicine. So actually, uh, he must knew some of the things about the anatomy. Our second founder of anatomy is Galen. Is Galen. And Galen lived in in Pergamon, what is called in present day as Turkey. So Galen, uh, he, su he suggested about the idea of great cerebral vein, and it is called the great cerebral vein of Galen. And also he suggested some of the things, or introduced the ideas about the circulatory, nervous, and respiratory system. So actually, he the one who he created the presence of those uh, structures or of those systems in the human body because by that time uh, nobody knew about uh, these structures so he was the one who introduced the ideas and he the one who can be regarded as the as the one as uh, the first person who knew them so one error in the galen ideas that he believed veins they converge in the liver uh, he knew about the circulatory system and all the ideas about the great cerebral vein, but one mistake that he, Galen, he believed the veins, they converge in the liver. However, actually, veins, they don't converge in the liver, they converge in the heart. So that's the major mistake or the error of Galen. And then <coughs> our third founder 
of anatomy is Andreas Vesalius. Andreas Vesalius is nowadays known as the founder of modern anatomy and the pathology. So he's the Belgian, Belgian in nationality, and he lived the uh, 1514 uh, until 1564. So Galen, he performed the uh, different dissections of cadavers to study about the muscles structure, arrangement of nerves, arrangement of muscles, bone structure. So Galen, he was the first scientist uh, to study uh, the study of anatomy by using cadavers and he, he made this he made this statue uh, which is present in Zakinstone uh, is present in Zakinstone and this statue is, uh, was made by Galen after dissecting uh, many cadavers he made this and not only this even if when you enter in the internet and then you search for the history of Galen you will see he made different statues are explaining about the muscles, arrangement of muscles in the human body. So that's why he's known as the father or the founder of modern anatomy and pathology because of a different dissection that he made, a different section, uh, dissection that he did, and he, he, he knew many things about anatomy. So actually he was the first person to know about the arrangement of muscles because he dissected many cadavers. And if you read in the history of Galen, uh, he was not agreed by many of the people who believed God because uh, they believed that he no need of dissecting cadavers and no need of studying the body structures because they, they believed that God is above all powers and he is able to cure uh, anyone who is sick. But Galen, he did that for the passion of knowing first the normal composition of human body then uh, I uh, could know about how the human body can appear if it is sick or if it is first with diseases. So that's all about the Andreas Vesalius. You can go in the internet and you can Google more about the Andreas Vesalius with the father of modern anatomy and pathology. Then from there we have William Harvey. Uh, William Harvey, he described correctly about the cardiovascular system. Actually, the cardiovascular system is the system made up of the heart and the blood vessels which are supplying the blood all over the body. So cardiovascular system is made up of the heart, uh, uh, arteries, aorta, then uh, vena covers, veins and capillaries. That's all in a collection we call it as a cardiovascular system. So the first person to explain correctly the cardiovascular system is William Harvey. And as we as we saw that he, Galen, he explained about circulatory system that is also sometimes called as a cardiovascular system, but he described it incorrectly by saying that the veins, they converge in the liver. So in this portion that we have studied the history and the founders of anatomy, you can be asked the MCQ question that who was the first uh, scientist to explain correctly the cardiovascular system? Or who, who is referred as the founder of modern anatomy and pathology? Or you can be asked, uh, what was the mistake of Galen in explaining cardiovascular system or circulatory system? So it is very important for you to note these things. Every part of our study had the questions in your exam. So don't jump these uh, by regarding them as they are not important. They are very important in your MCQ questions. And then from there, anatomy has some some of the sub disciplines. That means it is divided into different fields. And among the fields is gross anatomy, as I explained it before. Gross anatomy, we have histology or cell biology, we have embryology and neurology. So in neurology we are studying about the neurons and about the three fields of anatomy. I already explained them before. So first uh, in this module, that means module one of anatomy, we are studying about the gross anatomy. So gross anatomy is known is also known as macroscopic anatomy. In macroscopic anatomy, uh, we are explaining anatomy by viewing the structure using our naked eyes. In macroscoping, in my macroscopic anatomy, we are not using microscope. So we are explaining anatomy on the basis of the structure which we can view 
by our own eyes. So gross anatomy can be studied by dissecting cadavers or the use of anatomical models. And in dissecting cadaver, we are studying this in a module four that is dissectional anatomy. But in this module, we are studying first in the theory. So we are studying the theory of the whole body from the head and neck to the lower limb. And then after studying the theory, we will go to dissect the cadaver so that to see what we studied in theory, how does it appear in the real human body. So anatomy also can be studied by two approach that is regional or systematic approach. So by regions or by regional approach the body can be divided into six major regions. Our first region is the head and neck, then we have the upper limbs, then we have the thorax, then you have the abdomen, then you have pelvis and perineum, then you have the lower limb. So head and neck then upper limb, thorax, abdomen, pelvis and perineum, then lower limb. So by regional approach, by regional approach, uh, studies the boundaries, contents, structure, etc. in a particular region. So when we are studying the content, see boundaries and structures, we shall see later that when we are studying the abdomen, what are the boundaries of the abdomen? What are the contents of the abdomen? And what are the structures present in the abdomen? But when we are studying maybe the structures, we need to know about the bones, we need to know about the joints, we need to know about the muscles, fascia, about the blood vessels, lymphatics, drainage, nerves, and etc. As we shall see later, aponeurosis, as we shall see later when we are going to discuss about the uh, gross anatomy in details. By using systematic approach, anatomy can be uh, studied by dividing the body into systems. So we, we can study about osteology, that is the study of bones, myology, study of muscles, arthrology, study of joints, then angiology, study of blood vessels, neurology, study of nerves, then we can study about the digestive system, urinary system, reproductive system, endocrine system, and etc. So that are just approaches of studying anatomy. So methods of studying gross anatomy. In studying gross anatomy, uh, first we can dissect and observe the cadavers. As I told you that we'll do this in module 4 of anatomy, that is dissectional anatomy. But also we can use radiograph, that means you can use x-ray to study different structures of the body. Also we can use ultrasonograph or ultrasound. We can use ultrasound uh, to study some of the structures uh, and this is normally used in cases like pregnancy. Also we can use computer tomograph that is called CT scan. Computer tomograph that is called CT scan. Uh, computer tomograph is also the imaging. Radiograph, ultrasound and the computer tomograph, even magnetic, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. All of these the uh, methods of imaging. We are taking the image of the body, then we are studying that image. So magnetic resonance imaging is sometimes known as MRI. It is commonly known as, as MRI. Also we have angiograph, endoscope, and we have surface anatomy. So most of these methods, they are used in clinical cases. And because in anatomy, we have already know, uh, we already know the normal structure of the cell, so it is easier uh, to judge if the cell is still normal or if it, it is diseased. Or in anatomy, we already know about the normal physical appearance of the body organ. So it is easier to say that uh, the body organ has a deformity or it is still normal. Most of these, they are used in, in clinical cases, but dissection anatomy or observation, we are using it in study. And even surface anatomy, surface anatomy can be used in a clinical or even studying. But most of these methods of imaging, they are used in, in clinical cases. So first in this image, as you can see here, uh, this is the dissection of cadaver in the cadaver loom. And as you can see, this is the lower limb. Uh, the one who dissected here uh, tried to show uh, the nerve, the nerve in the lower limb. This is the sciatic nerve, and here they are the branches of sciatic nerve supplying the back of the lower limb. And here we have different bones at the table. These are different bones of human being, 
and also as you can see in this image we have some of the students uh, they are doing the exam and I hope even even most of you students who are studying anatomy if we start the section anatomy you do the exam like this is called the move exam uh, you are just uh, you are doing one equation at one point then you move to the next point you are doing the next question so this is the uh, cadaver room or dissectional room which we are dis uh, dissecting cadavers and here is the sample image showing the dissection of the lower limb also we have another method of studying anatomy that is radiograph this is chest x-ray this is normal chest x-ray and this is the chest x-ray showing to be so in anatomy uh, in in this in this part here we are not studying about how to interpret the x-ray but we are just uh, showing you the different methods of uh, studying anatomy so later uh, you will start about uh, interpreting these images that why are we saying this has uh, tuberculosis and why we are saying this has no uh, it is the normal lung so this is also the chest x-ray as you can see this is the heart then we have the clavicle bones we have the ribs we have the air in the lung which is black then you have the uh, their flagging so simply this also showed the checks uh, chest x-ray we have another method of studying anatomy that is ultrasound scan of glowing embryo during pregnancy so this is how the ultrasound image can be seen in the growing embryo uh, growing embryo during pregnancy the ultrasound image can be seen like this way another method is a uh, CT scan CT scan or it is called the CAT computer axiotomograph so for example this is the CT scan of the abdomen the CT scan of the abdomen transverse session through the abdomen you will discuss later about the transverse session and different sessions through the body so don't you worry that what what is meant by the transverse session we will understand it later when we are going to discuss in this session when we will be discussing about the language of anatomy so for example in this transverse session uh, we have cut through the abdomen and here as you can see these are large intestine this is the large intestine and this is the large intestine according to this image this is the right hand side of the body and this is the left hand side of the body uh, it's very difficult to understand this image if you don't know anatomy because for example here this is the liver present in the right hand side of the body so if you don't know anatomy it will be very difficult for you to understand that how are they cutting this body and how this side is the right hand side and this side is the left hand side but if you know anatomy it's very important uh, it's very easier for you to know for example here we have the vertebra um, through the cut this is the cut through the uh, vertebral column and you see here this is the lumbar vertebra so we will see later what uh, about these organs about the large intestine liver their positions in the body about the positions of vertebrae and etc also this is another method of studying anatomy magnetic resonance imaging uh, this is showing the brain and um, as you can see here we have the uh, cerebrum we have the cerebellum we have the medulla oblongata uh, then this is the continuation of the vertebral column here we have the mouth we have the the tongue here so we shall see later and we discuss all about these things uh, now let's start discussing about the anatomical or medical prefixes and the suffixes as we know prefixes they are words which are put before a certain word and the suffixes they are words which are put after a certain word so by starting with the prefixes uh, we have some of the common prefixes which are used in medicine so we we'll discuss them all of the, uh, we we'll discuss here all of them but some of them you will use them later in your second and third years but it is very important because here we are studying the basis the basis of anatomy so our first uh, terminology is adeno adeno simply means gland so for example example here if we are saying adenoid adenoid 
is the lymph gland found in the nasopharynx. So adenoid means adeno. This or uh, this piece of word adeno is the prefix which means gland. Alba. When you hear the word alba, alba means whitey. For example, in albinism, albinism is the white appearance of skin lacking melanin. So the word albinism, this uh, piece of word alba, alba means white. So in albinism, the skin appear white. That's why they call it albinism. Then you have algia. Algia means pain. So for example, when you are using neuroglia, neuroglia. So neuro, neuro means nervous system. Algia means pain. So if you connect these words, neuroglia, neuroalgia, neuroalgia. Neuroalgia means pain following the cause of a nerve or pain in the in the nerve. Then you have angio. So for example, algia is the suffix because it is the word which is put after a certain word. Then you have angio. Angio means vessel. So when we are saying angioplasty, angioplasty is the repair of blood vessel. We have arthro means joint. For example, arthro, arthritis, which means the inflammation of the joint. Itis, this itis means inflammation. So arthritis, arthritis means inflammation of the joint. Then we have blast. Blast means immature. For example, osteoblastoma means cancer of the bone cell. Uh, bone cell, they are immature cells. So that's why they are uh, osteoblastoma. As we said, uh, first is that blasto or blast means immature. So osteoblastoma. Osteo, they are the phase of the bone. Osteo means bone. Then a blast immature. This oma uh, indicates cancer or indicates uh, indicates malignancy. So osteoblastoma means cancer of the bone cell or cancer of the immature cells in the bone. Then we have blanch. Blanch means arm. For example, the blanchialis muscle moves to the arm. Blanchialis muscle. Blackialis. Black. E, this is known as black. So uh, actually it's not a blanch. It is a black. So this is really as a blackialis muscle. Blackialis muscle which is the muscle which moves the arm as we shall see later in the uh, muscles of the upper limb. Then you have bronco. Bronco means trachea or wind pipe. For example, is bronchitis. Bronchitis. Bronchitis is the inflammation of the upper respiratory system. Then you have book, which means cheek. 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 For example, is bucinata. Bucinata muscle. Bucinata muscle is the muscle in the cheek, as we shall see later about the muscles of mastication. Mastication. Then you have capit, which means head. For example, obliquus capitis is the muscle of the head and neck. Obliquus capitis. So the word capit comes from the origin that means head. Then you have cardia means heart. For example, cardiac arrest or cardiovascular disease means the diseases of the heart. Then you have cephal means head, for example, a uh, cephalic vein. So cephal means head or means towards head. So when we are saying something that it is cephalic, it means it is nearer or it is towards the head. For example, the cephalic vein. And then you have cerebral, that means brain. Cerebral means brain, for example, cerebral hemispheres. Then you have chole, that means bile or gall. For example, core core Sorry. For example, core That means the removal of the gallbladder. And another example is core cholangitis. Cholangitis. So some of these terminology they are difficult to uh, to read them, but I hope will be understood each other. Also we have another terminology which is chondro means cartilage. For example, a chondrocyte is the cell of the cartilage. Then you have another terminology which is 
Copas means body. For example, Copas albicans or Copas luteus in the white or yellow body inside the oval, as we shall see later in the historic. Then you have uh, cost means ribs. For example, costo cartilage means means is the cartilage which attaches the ribs to the sternum or costal resection. Then you have cyst uh, means sac. Cyst means sac. We have ductile means digits. For example, polydactyly means extra finger. Or pentadactyly means five fingers. We have derma means skin. For example, dermatitis, the skin disease. Dermatologist is the person who is studying about our uh, skin. We have dura means tough or hard. For example, we have the dura mater, one among the tough covering around the brain in the spinal cord. Uh, we have entero means intestine. For example, gastroenteritis means in the inflammation of the GIT. Uh, we have myo means muscle. For example, is the myocardial infraction. That is me uh, that means the inflammation of the heart muscles uh, cardio means heart so myo is the muscle cardio means heart infraction that is kind of inflammation so myocardial infraction that is inflammation of the heart muscles then you have necro means death or decay for example necrosis is the death of the cell tissue and then you have nephro means kidney for example nephros nephrons they are functional units of the kidney and the nephrology is the study of nephrons. Uh, then we have neuro means nerve. For example, ne neurology. Neurology is the study of neurons or the study of nervous system. We have odont means tooth. For example, is orthodontact refer to the repair of the teeth. And then you have uh, ophthalm means eye, for example, is ophthalmology means the study or medical surgery specialist of the eye disease. That is the uh, that is the cause of specialization. We have ortho means mouth, or I mean oro, not ortho. Oro means mouth. For example, is oral cavity. We have uh, osse or osteo means bone. Osse or osteo means bone. For example. Osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is the disorder of the bone, uh, which is characterized by the uh, impaired mineralization of the bone. So the bone becomes more porous, and it becomes very easier for breaking the bone. Or osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis. That is also the disease of the bones. We have auto means ear. For example, is otitis infection means the infection of the ear. Uh, then we have a phleb, means vein. For example, is the phlebitis, which is the inflammation of the vein. We have frame, means diaphragm. Uh, for example, the phrenic nerve, which is the nerve supplying the diaphragm. We have uh, pneumo, means lung. For example, pneumonia is the disease of the lung or in the inflammation of the lung. So pneumonia is always caused by the bacteria, but it is the disease which affects the lung. We have uh, palmo, means, which also means lungs. Uh, for example, is pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension, that is the hypertension of the raised blood vessel of the, the raid, raised uh, blood pressure of the vessel which supply the lungs. We have pyo which means pus. So, for example, is the pyruria, which means in the pus in the urine, pus in the urine. Urea means urine, so pyuria means pus in the urine. We have rin, which means nose, for example, is the rhinitis. We have status, which means stoppage or standstill. For example, is the homeostasis, hemostasis. Uh, we have thromb, which means clot or lump. For example, is the thrombosis, refer to a clot in the heart or in the blood vessel. Thrombosis, which is the clot in the blood vessel. So that's the end of the prefixes and the suffixes in the anatomy. And now we are going to discuss about the 
anatomical terms of references anatomical terms of references so in anatomy uh, we should know about the anatomical terms of references and it is very important because uh, all the anatomists in the world they are communicating by this language this is the language of anatomy so in anatomy when you are saying uh, maybe left or when you are saying right or when you are saying above or when you are saying beneath it will be very easier for you to be understood by your fellow and uh, your fellow anatomist if you know the anatomical terms of reference so these are important for smooth communication among the health professionals also for communication with the patients so first we should know about the concept of anatomical position what is the anatomical position when we are saying about the anatomical position anatomical position when referring to the body we communicate with other health professionals and also with the patient clearly. We therefore use the anatomical position as a reference. There are other common patient positions used for different clinical procedures, as we shall see later. But first, when we are discussing later, we will discuss about many things that maybe this organ is right or is left or is anyway. So we are considering to the anatomical positions. As you can see in this diagram, this is the person who has stand and this is what we call as the anatomical position. In the anatomical position, the body is upright. Upright means the head is above and then the legs they are below. The body is upright in the vertical axis. Then in the anatomical position, the legs and the feet they are parallel. As you can see the legs they are parallel in the anatomical position. Also in the anatomical position, the arms they are hanging by side, as you can see how the arms they are hanging, and how uh, how the hands have been put in the anatomical position. Then in the anatomical position, fingers they are extended. You see, fingers they are not folded; they are extended. Then you have palms and the face di di directed forward palms in the face directed forward. So this is the front of view of the anatomical position. This is the back view of the anatomical position. And this is the side view of the anatomical position. So I hope up to here, if I, I tell you to stand in the anatomical position, it will be very easier because you see these images and you see how the person is standing. And then from this image now, then we can describe different positions of the organ basing on the anatomical position. So this position of the body or how the man has a stand here, it is called as anatomical positions, anatomical position. So we have other other positions and they are used in different clinical uh, procedures. For example, is lithotomy position, lithotomy position. Uh, lithotomy position is the common position so list the lithotomy position is the very common position the common position for surgical procedures and the medical examination and more especially if we are doing the uh, surgical procedures involving the pelvis and the perineum so it's the most suitable for procedures involving the lower abdomen pelvis and perineum a common position for childbirth or delivery so you may be asked the mcq question that uh, a patient has a uh, pelvis a problem or had the problem in the reproductive system now what uh, what is the anatomical uh, anatomical position can be used for that patient when you want to do surgery so this is how the anatomical position which is called lithotomy can 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 appear or can be seen and this is the lithotomy position in the machine for the patient who is done uh, which is prepared for uh, the surgery or for the medical examin examinations and more especially here the, the medical examinations involving the reproductive system or involving the pelvis and the perineum or the lower abdomen so this is the lithotomy position and then from there we have um, the cubitus or is called the recumbent position recumbent position so as you can see the recumbent position has two types the light 
lateral recumbent and the left lateral recumbent position. So you can see the position of one arm is here and another arm, arm is here. So note there are many modifications to the position such as forward tilt, limb flexion or extension. For example, one of the limb can be flexed or extended. We shall see later what is means by the flexion and the extension of the of the limb. But this is what we call as the recumbent position or the cubitus position. Also another position is supine and prone positions. So this is the supine position. The face uh, the human face is uh, face, facing forward and as how you can see the, the legs they are parallel and then the hand is a line through the surface. Also this is prone in which the face is facing downward and the legs they are parallel, the hands they are lying horizontally. That is what we call as supine and prone positions. Also we have other common positions of patients. For example is the floral position. Floral position is used for the pas pas patients with respiratory or cardiac conditions. Patients with respiratory or cardiac conditions, we are using floral positions. This is very important for the patient with the respiratory problem, so as uh, he will be able to uh, to get air in and to to get air out easier as compared to the other anatomical positions. Also, we have um, uh, Tendenberg position. Tendenberg position uh, is used for the patients with with hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock is the shock caused by the uh, low blood volume. Low blood volume, maybe it is caused by the accident, maybe the car accident. So, for example, a patient has got the car accident, then the patient is rushed to the hospital uh, because of uh, hemorrhage. Then, what anatomical position can be used for such patient? So, you should know that uh, hemorrhage will lead to a hypovolemic shock. And the anatomic position for the patient with the hypovolemic shock is a uh, Tendenberg position. Note there are many modifications to flowers such as low, high, semi, cardiac, etc. So uh, this position uh, we may make this one to be low or to be high as compared to the conditions of the patient we are managing in such conditions. So this is all about the anatomical positions and this here is the example of the questions about the anatomical positions that is the question comes from the clinical and applied anatomy a patient with cardiac signs was rushed into the emergency unit and stabilizations of the vital signs ensured which body position would you recommend for this case and we already said uh, for the cases of the cardiac signs or pulmonary uh, signs of the patient, we are using the floor positions. Floor positions. So it's very important for you to know. As we say, the floor position is used for the cardiac or pulmonary sign, and the tendon position is used for the uh, hypovolemic shock, and the lithotomy position is used for delivery or for the surgeries involving the lower abdomen or the pelvis and the perineum. So, now let's go to see about the body planes. Body planes. Uh, in the body of human, we are using different lines or we are drawing different lines uh, which are indicating the planes of the body. Without using those lines, it could be very difficult to explain about the positions of different organs in the body. So we have the imaginary lines that divide the body into different parts. We have imaginary lines that divide the body into different parts. Uh, one among the planes or the line is the sagittal. It's called the sagittal plane. Sagittal or median plane. Uh, sagittal plane passes through the body, dividing it into right and the left halves. So by using the sagittal planes, we'll have two, uh, two pieces of the body. That means left and the right piece. And also we have a parasagittal or paramedian. 
So this plane is called sagittal or median, and we have parasagittal or paramedian. Parasagittal or paramedian plane is the line or is the imaginary line which is drawn parallel to the sagittal plane. So refer to the cut through the body that are parallel to the sagittal line. Also we have the coronal or we have the frontal. Coronal or frontal plane passes through the body dividing into uh, dividing it into front or anterior and back or posterior halves. So we shall see later in the diagram but it is very important for you to understand coronal or frontal divided the body into uh, anterior and posterior or divided the body into front and the back halves. And also we have another third plane which is the transverse plane. The transverse plane or horizontal plane divides the body into upper or superior and the lower or inferior halves. So as you can see in these diagrams, we have discussed the, uh, the three planes. Our first plane was median plane or sagittal plane. So as you can see, this plane has divided the body into the left part and then the right part is on the right hand side of the plane. So for example, according to the sagittal plane, you can see here, we have the right hand side and then we have the left hand side. This is according to the sagittal or median plane, divided the body into left and the right side. Also, we have the horizontal plane. You see, in the horizontal or transverse plane, it divides the body into a uh, superior and the inferior. Superior and inferior. So, superior is above the plane, and inferior is below the plane. Superior and the inferior halves. That means the upper and the lower half. Also, the coronal plane divides the body into the front and the back or divest the body into anterior and the posterior anterior and the posterior so these are the planes of the body which divides the body uh, into different sessions and when we are explaining positions of different organs in the body we should know about these planes now let's see about the terms of directions and when we are discussing about the terms of direction you should know about the uh, the planes which you have already discussed so firstly uh, we have superior and inferior and if you consider about the planes the plane or the axis of reference which tend to divide the body into superior and inferior it is called the transverse plane the transverse or horizontal plane it divides the body into superior and inferior so actually superior means in the structure superior a structure is superior when it is above or on the upper side of the another structure so if one structure is above or is on the upper side of another structure, it is considered as it is superior of that another structure. And the structure is considered as inferior if it is below, when it is below or on the lower side of another. So for example, lungs, they are superior to liver. Lungs, they are superior to liver. But we could also say that the liver is inferior to lungs. Because if the liver is there below the lungs, means the liver is inferior to lungs. So we can explain the position of the body parts of the body organs by using the superior and inferior uh, terms of uh, positions. For example, pelvis and perineum, they are inferior to the abdomen. Or we can say the abdomen is superior to the pelvis and the perineum. So that's all about the superior and the inferior. And as you can see, uh, the picture of the human body here, and this uh, picture tries to show different uh, terms of uh, directions. For example, uh, this side can be considered as superior and this as uh, inferior. So for example, the legs, the inferior of the pelvis and perineum, because the pelvis and perineum is here. So the, the lower limbs, the inferior to the pelvis and the perineum. But also because the abdomen is here, so the pelvis and the perineum, it is inferior to the abdomen. Also the abdomen, it is inferior to the thorax. You see, the thorax, it is inferior to the head and neck. So you see, different regions of the body, they can be considered as inferior or superior by using the axis of reference, which is a horizontal plane, or which is a transverse plane. Also, as you can see, this is the midline. So from the midline, 
or we can have some of the structure which are medial or lateral. Medial means they are uh, they are close to the midline. They are close to the midline or they are close to the uh, sagittal plane of the body. Uh, lateral structures, they are far from the midline. So, for example, uh, if we are considering, maybe we are considering uh, the heart and the lungs, because the lung, uh, the position of the, uh, the position of the heart, is close to the median line as compared to the lungs. So we can say the lungs they are lateral to the heart. Why they are lateral? Because if we consider from the median line, the lungs they are far from the median line as compared to the heart. So that is all about the lateral and the medial. In lateral and the medial, we are using. Uh, the sagittal plane at the plane of reference. Also, by using the sagittal plane, we have right and we have left. We have right and we have left. And when we are studying anatomy, don't get the image of a person as how you see. Because according to our eyes, we could say this is right, this is left. But this image is considered as if it is in plane mirror. So in plane mirror, the image uh, left becomes right and the right becomes left. So this actually this is the right hand side of the person in the image and this is the left hand side of the person in the image. Also we have some of the terms like proximal and distal. Proximal actually means it is near to the connection of the body and distal it is far from the connection of the body. So for example the hand uh, or the upper limb it is connected to the body here at the shoulder. So uh, the structures near the shoulder they can be considered as proximal and the uh, the structures far from the shoulder they can be considered as distal and for example the lower limb is connected to the body here at the pelvis so uh, the structures near to the pelvis the structures of the lower limb near to the pelvis they can be considered as proximal and those which are far from the pelvis they can be considered as uh, distal so here we have cranial and caudo. Cranial and caudo simply they are used more especially in, in the study of embryology. But cranial and, and the caudo they are using alternatively with the superior and the inferior. So in the study of embryology we are using more cranial and the caudo rather than using the terms of superior and the inferior. So cranial simply means towards head and the caudo simply means towards rump or towards the tail. So, for human being, because we don't have, actually, we don't have tail, that's why we are saying it is towards the ramp, instead of saying towards the tail. But kaudo, actually, simply it, is, it means towards the tail. Also, we have anterior and the posterior. Here, the, the axis of reference is coronal. Anterior, uh, the structure is anterior when it is in front of the another structure. When, when the structure is in front, it is considered as anterior. And when the structure is behind, it considered as the posterior. So, example, mouth is anterior to the is anterior to the ears. Mouth is anterior to the ears. Also, in the other words, we can say ears they are posterior to the mouth. The axis of reference here is the coronal. Also, we have ventral and dorsal. Ventral and dorsal. Ventral and dorsal. They are used the. Uh, more especially in embryology, and they are used alternatively to the terms of anterior and the posterior. So, anterior, in other words, it is ventral, and the posterior, in other words, it is the dorsal. So, for example, in the feet and hand, replace the width, ventral surface of the hand, which is the palma. Ventral surface of the heart is called the palma, and the ventral surface of the foot is called the plantar, ventral surface. Ventral means anterior. In both of the hands and feet, the dorsal surface, or it is called the dorsum, keeps its name. So that is all about the uh, ventral and dorsal. Uh, the axis of reference is still coronal. And then we have superficial and deep. Here we don't have the axis of reference. Actually, the axis of reference is the body surface. And the center of the body or organ, the center of the body or organ. Superficial means uh, the structure 
is close to the skin and deep means it is close to the center of the body so a structure that is superficial is close to the skin the structure that is superficial is close to the skin than another structure for, for example a flexor digitorum superficialis muscle so this is the muscle present in the uh, in the in the forward limb and in the upper limb I mean in the forearm of the upper limb flexor digitorum superficialis muscle so we shall see later on the naming of muscles but the flexor digitorum superficialis uh, the word superficialis it is because it is superficial so as we shall see later that we have the flexor digitorum profundus flexor digitorum profundus means it is deep so the word profundus or profundus profundus means it is deep so flexor digitorum superficialis muscle it is above or it is close to the skin as compared to the flexor digitorum profundus muscle so a structure that is deep is close to the center of the body or extremity and therefore further away from the skin or outer surface for example flexor digitorum profundus muscle also other example the abdominal muscles are superficial to the intestine because if we cut through the body surface we cut first the abdominal muscles and then we meet the intestines so the abdominal muscles they are superficial to the intestine uh, also the intestine in other language they are deep they are deep to the abdominal muscles in the other language also other terms which can be used external and internal the same idea is used as superficial and deep superficial is sometimes called as inter, uh, external and the deep is sometimes called as internal but used in reference to a cavity uh, if we have a certain cavity cavity means we have a certain shape and it is filled with air nothing is present inside that's why we call as external surface and internal surface external means it is outside the cavity and internal means it is within the cavity also external and internal uh, they can be used they can be used in some of the structure such as uh, carotid artery carotid artery and iliac artery or vein iliac artery or vein so for example here the scar the scar can be act like a cavity because inside actually inside of the scar uh, it is it is filled with the brain and the other of the balance and things like that but actually because the scar if we remove the brain it appears like a cavity uh, we can name some of the brain uh, some of the blood vessels as they are external of the scar of the or they are superficial superficial means they are outside or they are external of the scar as you can see this blood vessel some of the blood vessel they enter they enter the uh, they enter the the scar and they normally they are called as the internal for example here the internal carotid artery uh, it supply the uh, blood to the brain so it enters the the scar it enters below the scar then it goes to supply the the brain so it is called the internal carotid artery but the external carotid artery supplies uh, some of the structures which are outside of the scar such as skin and nose as you can see the divisions of the external carotid artery into different blood vessels as we shall see as we shall study later uh, in the blood vessel uh, blood supply of the head and neck but here is for you to understand the idea idea of the external and the internal for example here this is the carotid uh, common carotid artery and it is divided into the internal carotid and the external carotid so the common carotid artery has been divided into internal carotid artery and external carotid artery basing on the uh, blood supply that the uh, the blood vessel supply the the blood uh, to the structures inside the scar or outside the the scar also we have medial and lateral the axis of reference is sagittal we have medial and lateral medial means a structure that is medial is closer to the 
median or to the sagittal line and the structure which is lateral uh, it is further or away from the median line for example the big toe is medial to the pink toe the pink toe is lateral to the big toe so actually that is because when we are considering the position of the big toe and the posi position of the pink toe that is means the the small toe of the hand or of the leg and actually here we are considering uh, the big toe of the leg because actually for the hand in the anatomical position are uh, the in the anatomical position for the hand the thumb can be seen as if it is lateral to the pink toe in the anatomical position so we are considering the big toe of the the leg and then we have ipsilateral or contralateral uh, the point or the the axis of reference here is the sagittal sagittal plane if we are saying ipsilateral means the body organs or the structures they lie on the same side of the body ipsilateral ipsilateral contra 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 means difference so actually when you are reading about these terminologies sometimes you can be uh you can be confused because they are many but contra Cont contrast means different so contralateral means the uh, uh, the body structures the are uh, on different sides of the body for example if you have some uh, of the structure which are on the right hand side and we have some of the structure which are on the left hand side then the structures on the left hand side they are considered as the uh, contralateral to the structures on the right hand side for example if we are considering uh, the stomach and the spring the stomach and the spleen all of them they are on the uh on the left hand side of the abdomen so actually the stomach is not on the left hand side but uh most of its portion is on the left hand side of the abdomen so you can say that the the stomach and the spleen they are ipsilateral or we can say the spleen and the left kidney they are ipsilateral we can say the liver and the right kidney they are ipsilateral but the liver and the left kidney they are contralateral or the left kidney and the right kidney they are contralateral or the right lung and the left lung they are contralateral but when you are considering the left lung and the left kidney they are ipsilateral so these they are commonly used in neurology in regard to the nerve distribution if the nerve supplies the ipsilateral side of the body or if it supplies the contralateral sides of the body also we have proximal and distal as we explained in the previous diagram that the axis of reference here is the center of the body when you are saying the structure is proximal means it is uh, near to the attachment of the body pro pro something like it is near to the attachment of the body but distal means the structure is far or it is away from the attachment of the body for example uh the anchor joint the anchor is distal to the knee joint but proximal to the toes so the anchor joint is distal from the knee but in other words we can say the knee joint it is proximal to the anchor joint just the same so we are considering the position of the structure or the position of the joint and then we are considering also uh, the attachment of that structure to the body or the attachment of the two structure to the body then we are viewing that which structure is closer to the body as compared to the another structure also we have supination and pronation supination and pronation these are terms of movement the movement of the arm movement of the arm or movement of the upper limb supination and pronation in supination and pronation there are terms that refer to the movement towards a supine or the prone position supine or prone position so if you are moving your hand towards the supine position means it is supination or when you are moving your hand towards the prone position means it is uh pronation so the forearm pronates when the palm is turned towards posterior of the body when the palm is turned towards the posterior of the body so as we said uh, before that uh, the palm is 
is the anterior in the anatomic composition the palm is the anterior and it lies anterior in the anatomic position so when we turn the palm when we turn the palm to the posterior of the body that is what we call as pronation to the anterior of the uh, i mean to the posterior of the body we are turning the palm to the posterior of the body also the forearm supinates the forearm supinates when the palm is turned towards the anterior of the body so that means if you want to do supination first the palm should be posterior and then when we are turning it towards anterior we supinate also if you want to do pronation the palm should be anterior first and when you are turning it to the posterior we are pronating so for example here what you can see um, this is the diagram of the hand and this is the left hand this is the left hand so as you can see pronation is the turning of the arm towards the posterior turning of the palm towards the posterior so this is the left hand and as you can see here we are we are just seeing the back of the arm so the palm is turned to the posterior of the body is turned to the posterior of the body and that's what we we consider as pronation and if the palm is turned to the anterior of the body like in this image below here that is called supination so also here we have supine and prone and i hope by discussing this supination and pronation you have already understood even the meaning of the supine and the prone so for example in a clinical and applied anatomy which movement is employed at the forearm when loosening a bolt into a nut with a light upper limb with a light upper limb so uh, you are using a right upper limb and then you are loosening a bolt so this is the clinical and applied anatomy question uh, according to the movement or types of movement of the forearm which we have already studied so which movement is employed at the forearm when loosening a bolt into a nut with a right upper limb so by using a uh, right upper limb uh, the movement which is applied uh, it is a pronation it is a pronation because uh, we are moving the the upper limb we are moving the upper limb the palm from forward towards the posterior so it's a pronation now let's uh, finish our discussion with the terms of movement and here we are discussing the terms of movement of the forward limb or the upper limb and the the lower limb uh, first we have adduction or abduction these are two different terminology the axis of reference uh, in these two terminologies is the center of the body or or structure or the axis of reference it is sagittal plane now these terms are used to describe movement of limbs in relation to the center of the body adduction is the movement towards the center of the body or the center of the structure and the abduction movement is away from the center of the body or the center of the structure uh, we shall see later in the diagram how are these movement illustrated but this is the basic which you should understand abduction it is movement towards the center then abduction it is away from the center we have also flexion and extension here in the flexion and extension are the point of reference the angle of a joint so actually flexion and extension uh, should take place uh, through a, a certain point so flexion is the movement that decreases the angle of a joint and extension the movement that increases the angle of a joint as we shall see later in the diagram now muscles often include terms of flexion often include terms of flexion in naming muscles uh, we are often using flexor and extension as extensor in the names for example is flexor digitorum profundus and the extensor hallucis longus so Tana kuona kwamba ile manake maso ikiwa inaitwa flexor inafanya kazi ya ku flex ikiwa inaitwa extensor inafanya kazi ya ya ku extend kwa hiyo pia tuna movement inaitwa circumduction hiyo circumduction point of reference in the center of a structure center of a structure so for example uh, the common example of this movement ina take place kwenye shoulder joint shoulder joint yenyewe ni joint ambayo inalau 
uh, circumduction movement. So circumduction is a directional company movement around the center of a structure. Kamba kono ono mkono, that means umenzi hapa, uliko umeseko, umeseko. So umkono unakona wezo kumuvu kwenye movement hile pale. Ambawe movement ndo inaitua circumduction. Because the center of the structure is the shoulder joint. The structure of the shoulder allows the upper extremity to circumduct the shoulder joint. So this is the circumduction. And as you can see in this uh, diagram, uh, how can we describe abduction and adduction? As we said that abduction is the movement away from the center of the structure or away from the center of the body. So for example, here the fingers, they are moved away from the center. Uh, we can consider the center of these uh, fingers as maybe here at the palm. Now moving the fingers away uh, from the center of the palm, it is called the abduction. And then moving them towards each other, it is called the adduction. Then about deflection and extension, uh, here we may consider uh, the joint which is present here. And then uh, flexion is the movement which will flexion is the movement which will make the fingers to be close. And extension is the movement will uh, the movement which will make these two fingers to be far apart from each other. But you can understand this later when we are, uh, we are, uh, we are dealing with the, some of the joint of the upper limb and even of the lower limb. So for example here, you can see in this diagram, uh, this is considered the friction of the thumb because you have decreased the angle of the joint here. So this is flexion. And then the movement of the thumb to this direction, as you can see here, it is called extension because it increases the angle here. So uh, the movement is regarded as extension. Then we have adduction. For example, here we have adduction of the thumb. Uh, adduction uh, causes the thumb to move or adduction is the movement of the thumb towards the the I mean the center of the of the palm so it moves towards the other fingers then abduction we are moving the thumb away from other fingers from there we have a uh, movement of, of hands also here so as you can see this is a uh, reposition and this is all position Reposition means uh, you are placing fingers in their uh, original or in their uh, uh, position which they could be required to stay in the normal or in the anatomical position. And all position means, for example, here as you can see this pink finger and the thumb, uh, they, are, they are touching each other. That is opposition. Also, we have the movement of the foot. As you can see, this is called as E inversion inversion so you flex the foot towards inside that towards inside for example this is the right foot the right foot the foot of the of the right leg so you flex the foot inside and the air version you flex the foot towards outside outside your body and for for, for this case of this leg uh, it is possible to either like placing it downward it is called a plantar flexion because this surface of the leg it is called a plantar so plantar flexion means you flex the leg uh, towards the plantar and this is called the dorsification because this is considered the dorsal surface of the leg so dorsification is moving the leg towards the, uh, the upper side and this is the neutral position of the leg. Actually, this marks uh, the end of our lecture on the terms of positions, but further more details on the diagrams and, tem and terms of uh, positions, even the language of anatomy, they are found in these two books. Uh, we have the Clinical Anatomy by Regions, edition 9, written by the Richard S. Nail. This is our best reference of anatomy, and uh, the reference is Atlas of Human Anatomy thick edition written by the flank netter so if you are going to internet maybe you want to search these books this is known by its name at the clinical anatomy by regions ninth edition by richard s nail and this is known by its name as the netter's atlas of human anatomy 
Also, we have some of the of other reference books such as the Moure. Uh, that is also the book which can be used in gross anatomy. Moure. Uh, we have another reference book uh, such as the Gray's Anatomy. All of those books they are good books to use them as a reference book. We have uh, Snell's Neuro Anatomy uh, for for the module one and even module four. We will start about the neuro anatomy, so using the scenarios atlas of neuro anatomy. So thank you everybody. In the next session, we'll be discussing about the osteology. So just stay tuned. In the next session, we'll be discussing about the osteology. Thank you everybody. Nice studies. <laughs>